Castlevania is one of the greatest video game series of all time, even without a major release in forever now. Looking at how much it pioneered, how much it established, and especially the incredible legacy its games have left behind, it can still be felt strongly today. With a history as expansive as this one, its storyline throughout the years is one that unexpectedly managed to evolve into an important part of its identity. A huge generational saga featuring the timeless battle of good versus evil, hunters versus monsters, the Belmont clan versus Dracula and his army of the night. A simple, compelling tale that captured the hearts and imaginations of many players who played these games. While it was very straightforward in the beginning, the scale of this connective narrative naturally became more and more ambitious over time. Gameplay was always the primary focus, but this story was one that was being treated with care, attention, and detail. Established tropes were majorly innovated on, and the story became way more engaging and something to start paying attention to. Eventually, Castlevania started to build up to a big event in its continuity with the release of Aria of Sorrow. 1999, the Battle of 1999, the Demon Castle War of 1999. This mysterious conflict was hinted at throughout the stories of each modern release that followed as well, and what these hints described was one of the best sounding Castlevania experiences ever told. A final, ultimate confrontation between the Belmont clan and the Dark Lord Dracula in the most epic, over the top fashion possible that only a series like this could pull off. This final battle sounded absolutely incredible, and that Naturally, this story had to be an upcoming game release in the future, right? <sighs> Unfortunately, this infamous foreshadowed tale never came to be. Despite this, the Demon Castle War of 1999 remains without a doubt the single most important event in the entire Castlevania series. From a story perspective, it represents the culmination and climax of the nearly 20 year long narrative told through each and every canonical game. From the developer's perspective, it represents what would have been the most ambitious game in the entire franchise, and from a real life right now perspective, it represents everything the series should be, along with the sad dose of reality of where it actually is. No matter how you spin it, Castlevania 1999 is tied to the legacy of these games forever, and its absence is one that will be felt until it comes to fruition, which is very, very, very unlikely at the moment, to put it kindly. In this video, I'll be going over everything we know about this unseen chapter of the timeline. All the details in every game and piece of media that foreshadowed it, every character that could have played a part of it, what happened and what the game might have been like, my past sins, my personal pain as a passionate fan of the series, and much more. This is a big one, guys, and a long time coming if you've been following this channel for sure. So don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and comment your thoughts down below. It's Free, it means the world and tremendously helps the channel. I appreciate you all so much. Genuinely, thank you. Spoiler alert for every Castlevania game listed here. If you'd like to skip to a certain game, book, or see me present the events of 1999 as a complete legend, be sure to take a look at the chapters down below. First, let's begin with its inception during Symphony of the Night's development. It would be the director of arguably the series most popular game, Symphony's Tonshiharu Furukawa, that came up with the concept of the Demon Castle War. While we don't know the specific details of how much he planned for it during its development, essentially he had just mapped out what could be this long story's most important and potential endgame event. With the game's critical success, it laid the groundwork for future titles to build upon this newly established Metroidvania formula. Koji Igarashi, the assistant director and scenario writer for Symphony of the Night, would be promoted to become the producer and guiding head of the entire game series after this. Furukawa's concept of the final battle with Dracula would finally be utilized by Igarashi six years later in the 2003 Game Boy Advance title, Aria of Sorrow. This is where its story really begins. In the Castlevania timeline, Aria of Sorrow takes place in the far ahead future of 2035, which is extremely detached from the events of the entire rest of the series, as this is the end of the chronology, placing its story after every single game, with a few exceptions we'll get to. This is the game that established the Demon Castle War as an event that happened in the lore, so much so that it's one of the main focuses of this story, casting an unavoidable eclipse over the whole experience. Nearly every character here is linked to, or has an opinion on, the blood Battle of 1999, and Soma Cruz as a protagonist is learning this information just as us the players are. Through Soma, everything we learn about it in Aria of Sorrow changes the course of Castlevania forever. 
Mr. Smugface Graham Jones is the first person in the series to introduce us to the event during his encounter with Soma. He establishes where they are, Dracula's true castle, and how it was sealed inside a dark solar eclipse by vampire hunters during the year 1999. Dracula is said to have been completely destroyed by this group of hunters, and they did this by ending his infamous resurrection cycle by cutting him off from the aforementioned castle, the source and symbol, as Graham puts it, of Dracula's chaotic power during the battle. He brings up the prophecy of 9 1999, which Soma instantly recognizes as Nostradamus's great prophecy. Yes, that Nostradamus, the real-life astrologer that lived during the 15th century and was most well known for his book of prophecies. While Nostradamus himself is an extremely interesting historical figure that I recommend looking into if you're interested, his role in Castlevania is tied to one of his most accurate predictions and also one of his least, a total solar eclipse that happened over Europe on August 11th, 1999. He was spot on, the other being a warning. Quote, the year 1999, seventh month. From the sky will come a great king of terror, to bring back to life the great king of the Mongols. Before and after, Mars to reign by good luck. Castlevania would interpret this as Dracula resurrecting at full power, a king of terror. This is the real life inspiration to the events of the Demon Castle War of 1999. The final key piece of info Graham gives us about the event is the church's involvement, who we find out tried to keep Dracula a secret from the world, but it was leaked, and mysteriously so with the way he puts it. He seems to have learned all about the Battle of 1999, as well as Dracula's other resurrections because of this leak, and through the criminal underworld. Thank you so much, Graham. I'm sure you're not a crazy cult leader that wants to inherit all the Dark Lord's powers. Alright, you have a good day now. Next, we can get a lot more insight through optional interactions with Mina. As we'll find out, her family is heavily intertwined with this mysterious event. She first tells us about her knowing Arakado <coughs> <Alucard. coughs> for many years now, as he is a frequent visitor to the Hakuba Shrine she lives at. As we learn at the beginning of the game, the Hakuba Shrine is an ancient shrine with strong ties to Japanese mythology. Mina is the only daughter of the caretaker, so she knows people who have been visiting for many years. Mina also recalls Arakado is somehow involved in national intelligence. As I said on my original video on the Castle War, it's something like S.H.I.E.L.D. from Marvel, baby! But it's most likely the Japanese government. We actually never find out what it is, as it's never said. After the first conversation with good guy Graham, if you go back to Mina, she reveals even more. She tells Soma about the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise, a Sith legend- <laughs> no, I'm just- I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. She tells Soma about the story of the Amanawato Shrine, one of the most well-known legends in Japanese mythology that just so happens to be similar to the events of 1999. As Castlevania describes it, this is a legend about the sun goddess, Tenchul Dolgem, calming down her younger brother's rage, the storm god Susano, by by containing his anger in a solar eclipse. This is loosely based on the real-life Japanese myth, Amaterasu and the cave. The story of the real legend is a lot longer and honestly completely separate, but Castlevania does its own thing with this story to relate it to the Demon Castle War, which is fine. After explaining the Castlevania Solar Eclipse version of the myth to Soma, we learn the Hakuba Shrine is dedicated to praying to the solar eclipses that represent the ability to confine anger and evil intentions. Usually, these celebratory ceremonies are only held for Japan solar eclipses, but in 1999, one of these powerful rituals was conducted in Europe the well-known home of Dracula's castle. At this point, we've learned a damn good amount of what went down in 1999, but Arya still has so much more to tell. Soma meets a mysterious exorcist known as Jay. He has a terrible case of amnesia and has been told he was in an accident during 1999. He woke up in a hospital sometime after and has completely forgotten his name and past. Despite this, Jay continued to live his life, but he is filled with fear when Dracula is brought up. He can't help but be drawn to the Dark Lord and his missing past seems to be coming back to him within these walls. The two speculate Dracula was most likely involved in his accident, especially because of the bizarre circumstances and the fact Jay has magical powers. The two part ways on good terms for now, but I'll just say, Jay is the most important character related to the Demon Castle War. Later in the story, if you go back to the entrance to speak with Mina after a cutscene with Yoko, she tells us something that doesn't sound important at first, but it's actually super insightful. She tells us how Yoko Balnades has been visiting the Hakuba Shrine for many years, since Mina was very young, and how she is like a sister to her. So, not only has Alucard been visiting the shrine for many years, but also Yoko, the far ahead future descendant of Castlevania III's Saifa Balnades. Hmm, very interesting, I wonder what that could imply. Soma reunites with Jay 
Jay later in the story, but now he has regained all his memories. Dracula's presence in the castle seems to have made them all flood back to him at once, and now he remembers the events of 1999 crystal clear. Jay is a Belmont, Julius Belmont, an heir to the famous clan of vampire hunters that fought Dracula for the past 1,000 years. Julius was the one to defeat Dracula in 1999 along with the other warriors who assisted him. He then tells us a key piece of how he defeated Dracula during the battle. Using his family heirloom, the legendary vampire killer Whip, he somehow sealed it inside the castle to weaken Dracula's soul and dark powers. A pivotal turning point in the events of 1999 for sure. Here in Arya's story, Julius aims to retrieve his weapon where he left it during the battle 36 years ago. So and Julius part ways once again, with Julius on his way to get it back. Of course, the most iconic weapon in the entire series. Through story and interactions, this is everything we learned about the conflict in Arya, but looking around the game and instruction manual, we can find even more, really showing us the true scope of this event. Right away, the zombie soldiers are extremely prevalent. On the surface, these look like your normal Castlevania zombies, but as we can find out, these are the animated corpses of the soldiers who fought in the Demon Castle War. There's your standard foot soldier, and we can also find stronger variants representing officers and lieutenants. It's a super cool detail and something you can easily overlook playing casually, but I think the biggest takeaway we can learn from these fallen soldiers is that there was a full-on siege at Dracula's castle, the scale of which killed countless at these sections of the map. We can learn a bit more about this army through an equipable soldier uniform we can buy from the homie Hammer. This being a unique sprite, it's probably what the lieutenants looked like. Looking at the character profiles in the instruction manual, there's some more important details we can find. The Hakuba clan shrine is known as the Shrine of White Horses. It could be inspired by a few different real life temples, but I couldn't find one in Japan. Still, it's worth noting, and let me know if this means anything to you guys. Finally, Graham's profile reveals he was born the 7th month of the year 1999. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And this is kind of huge because Graham's birthday represents the exact moment in Castlevania Dracula was defeated, as we find out in his second encounter with Soma. This brings up an interesting question though. When did the Demon Castle War begin? As the answer is kind of messy. From all the information we have, it ended in July of 1999. That we know because of Good Guy Graham's birth, but the real life solar eclipse happened next month on August 11th in Europe. So it couldn't have begun in August since Dracula died the month before. Castlevania pretty much puts the two Nostradamus prophecies we talked about earlier together, and accommodating for both of them in this story creates an inconsistency. But in Castlevania, all we really have is its ending in the seventh month of the year. So either way, it started sometime within these few months. I'm getting a headache just thinking about this one, oh no. Okay, that's everything we learned about the Demon Castle War in Aria of Sorrow. Pretty freaking cool stuff, especially for its introduction. With the success of Aria and the release of the Nintendo DS, Igarashi and his team would make a direct sequel to the game, continuing Soma Cruz's adventure on the new handheld. Still taking place in the far ahead future of the Castlevania chronology, this sequel would take place a year later in 2036. It was released on the DS two years after Aria on August 25th, 2005. While Dawn of Sorrow doesn't have nearly as much in information on the conflict as its predecessor, there's still vital lore here we need to look at. In Dawn of Sorrow, Julius and Arakato are already very well acquainted despite us never seeing them interact in Arya. They work very well together and they both always take initiative every time we see them. Hmm, it's almost like these two save the world together. This is worth highlighting because as we come to find out, Arakato, <sighs> alright guys, Alucard was there in person during the events of 1999, and fought alongside Julius as one of the others who assisted him. 37 years later, and that bond and mutual respect for each other is still there. Every time they're on screen together you can tell, even in the bonus mode featuring them as playable characters. It's subtle but very noticeable throughout the story once you pick up on it. Two of the main antagonists, Dario and Dimitri, are very similar to good guy Graham from the previous game. Like him, they were both born the exact moment of Dracula's defeat during the 7th month of 1999. 99. Similar to Graham, they both possess magical powers because of their untimely births, although Dimitri clearly got the better end of the stick compared to both of them, like damn. For those of you who played the game, you know what I'm referring to. But yeah, everyone who was born the moment Julius defeated Dracula gained some kind of dark power. Very unlikely this will ever be expanded upon, but it's definitely an interesting side effect of Dracula's permanent defeat. With Dawn taking place at the headquarters of the cult group within Light, and not in Dracula's castle like in every other Castlevania ever, there are no enemies that reference the Battle of 1999 like in Arya, and also pretty much no items that do as well, with the exception of one, Mina's Talisman. 
This item has an important role in the story, and it not being from the cult headquarters, it makes sense that it's the only item to reference 1999 even a little. A talisman from the Hakuba Shrine, said to suppress dark souls. From everything we've established about Mina's family, this is in line with their powers and rituals. However, looking at the game's library entries, we can really get into how important her family was. We know the Hakuba clan did perform a powerful ritual that sealed Dracula's castle inside the Dark Eclipse, but these entries tell us exactly who. The priest of the Hakuba Shrine only one. And this refers to someone we heard about in Arya of Sorrow, Mina's caretaker. This guy we can see reference to all throughout the previous chapter was super important, and he was likely a major character in the events of 1999. Why would Mina overhear things like Alucard and National Intelligence, and the one exception ritual that happened in Europe? Maybe one of the reasons Alucard visits the shrine is to keep his Hakubo clan friend informed, as he is essentially guarding Dracula's sealed castle. These library entries confirm a lot of what we already know, and honestly really makes the story more cohesive, especially with the attention to detail they put into the ones that tell us about 1999. For example, it expands on a lot that happened to our characters after the battle. Julius' 36 year long amnesia, god damn that's tough. Him joining the church once he gets his memory back, Alucard sealing his powers, and most interesting, the vampire killer slowly losing its power. After Aria of Sorrow, the legendary whip is said to not be as strong anymore. Here it's confirmed it still has a little energy, but why did it fade away at the end of the game? My theory, it's important to remember the whip was literally binding to Dracula's castle to weaken the Dark Lord's spirit. The extent Julius sealed the whip to the castle, we don't know. But I think the reason his powers faded away has something to do with this. Not confirmed, but let me know what you guys think. Definitely not as much as Arya, but that's everything we can learn about the Demon Castle War in Dawn of Sorrow. It being... <sighs> debatably, the last game in the timeline. You would think there's no more info we can get from the future era of the series. However, if you watch my videos, you know there's one more piece of media we can look at that takes place post-1999. The light novel, Rooker Danza of the God's Abyss. Or reminiscence of the Divine Abyss, there's a lot of mix and matching you can do since it was never officially translated, but Rickardanza sounds the coolest so we're sticking with that. For those of you who haven't seen my video on it, this light novel was one of the last Castlevania anythings Koji Igarashi was involved with. It is the last story in the Castlevania chronology and takes place one year after Dawn of Sorrow. Soma is in it, but only briefly, with the focus mainly being on two new characters, the apprentice to Julius Belmont, Curtis Lang, and the long ahead future descendant of Castlevania at 3's Grant Dynasty, Michelle Dynasty. In terms of new information, Rikardanza is definitely the least telling of these post-1999 experiences. It's only referenced a couple of times and contains what we already know from the two Sorrow games. However, the mere existence of one of the characters I mentioned needs to be considered, Michelle Dynasty. Grant has obviously had it super rough in Castlevania. I mean, Judgment, Netflix, the years have not been kind to our boy. But one of the few times he was actually celebrated was in this light novel through his descendant, as Michelle is practically the main character here. It describes her in her early 20s, so she couldn't have played a part in the battle, but someone from her family easily could have. While Michelle is not part of the church like Julius, Yoko, or Curtis, she still goes on expeditions for them. She's like a freelance hunter, almost like Batman in the Justice League. I'm a part-timer, remember? I bring this up because this shows she still had a good standing with them, one of the most important organizations that were involved in 1999. We have proof that the Nazis were alive because of her, and I don't think they would have sat by during the most important battle ever. Also, this would complete the Castlevania 3 homage. We have a Belmont, we have a 93% most likely Belnot is there, Alucard is Alucard of course, and we only need one more. It's definitely worth considering. I personally think Michelle's mom or dad could have been one of the others who assisted Julius, but it's important to keep the Nazis in mind. There's nothing that tells us they couldn't have played a part, and it makes too much sense. If you're interested in Rick Danza, definitely be sure to check out my video on it. But back to 1999, there are, again, debatably no more games or books taking place in this future time period. Now that we've looked ahead, we have to look back at what happened before. 1999 was an established event in the chronology of the series now, and the next games would have to keep this in mind, even maybe giving us more information regarding it. What came out after the two Sorrow titles would bring us back to Castlevania before the Demon Castle War. And when I say before, I mean right before. The next title would be the fan favorite, Portrait of Ruin. 
Taking place in 1944 during World War II, Portrait of Ruin follows Jonathan Morris, the current wielder of the Vampire Killer Whip at this time, and his friend, Charlotte Allen, in their quest to stop the latest reincarnation of Dracula's castle. Besides Arya, Portrait is the closest game in the timeline we have to the events of 1999, and as such it's pretty damn important. For the full context, I'd recommend watching my Quincy Morris and Lacard videos, but for now I'll briefly summarize the main points of them to show you how we got to this game's story. Richter Belmont. The the strongest vampire hunter of his time would give up the mantle of the vampire killer whip to his distant relatives, the Morris clan, for unknown reasons. With Richter, the Belmont clan would then vanish from history for the next few hundred years after, and would not emerge again until 1999. In the meantime, his trusted successors, the Morris clan, with help from the Lacard clan, would successfully keep Dracula at bay during this time. Portrait of Ruin is the culmination of the Morris clan's journey, and picks up with the last Morris clan member we know of, Jonathan. Now in this game's story, we learn about everything I just said through a conversation with Wind, otherwise known as the GOAT, Eric Lacard. In one of the most important conversations in the entire series, Eric tells us that only ones with the blood of a Belmont are capable of using the Vampire Killer's true power, and if anyone else needed to use that strength, they would have to give up a part of their life force. Frustrated, Jonathan asks why the Belmont gave the whip to the Morris clan, since it had caused their family so much pain. Quincy Morris, Jonathan's dad, John Morris from Bloodlines, they both essentially sacrificed themselves for the greater good. But why? This is what Eric responds with. Because the Belmonts cannot touch the whip now, it is predicted that Dracula will be revived in the year 1999. I have heard that the Belmonts must not touch the vampire killer until then. But. Others have appeared to revive Dracula in the meantime. Somebody has to stand up and stop them, and only the Morris family is able to do that. Besides the fact that I absolutely love this interaction, this shows how Nostradamus' prophecy has impacted the lives of the Belmont, Morris, and even Lacard clans. So much sacrifice and pain, but all to prepare for 1999. At the end of the game, the King of Terror himself makes a big threat about his next revival. Say what you will, but I can see it. One day, my power will be fully revived. Fully or not, you're never, ever gonna win. I look forward to seeing who will have the last laugh. That one day Dracula was talking about would, of course, be 1999. This is everything we can learn about it in Portrait of Ruin, and with such a long gap between this game and Arya, we have to make quite a bit of assumptions to figure out what the hell happened between 1944 and 1999. However, there are a few more games we can look at with info on the Demon Castle War that can also tell us, the next of which doesn't really take place in any time period specifically. After the Nintendo DS trilogy, one month later, Igarashi and his team would then release one of the most controversial Castlevania games ever on November 18th, 2008 for the Wii, Castlevania Judgment. So, I've talked about Judgment throughout a lot of my previous videos, even in relation to story elements, but with the focus on 1999, we can actually find some interesting information through its narrative here. Each character in this game is plucked from a point in the timeline for their story mode, and their endings usually always lead into a Castlevania game they're in, with a few fascinating exceptions we'll get to. First and most importantly, Alucard's story mode. He's taken some time after Symphony of the Night and before 1999, so this version of him is between those couple hundred years. Alucard is still trying to find a way to stop his father Dracula for good, as the King of Terror is still doing the usual resurrecting once every hundred years. Well, once if they're lucky. He's taken to the Time Rift by Aeon, basically an immortal god that watches over the Castlevania timeline, only occasionally interfering like he does in this game. The Time Rift is under attack by the Time Reaper, and Aeon asks Alucard to stop this cataclysmic threat. Pretty straightforward, as fighting games like this usually are, but we get some pretty cool interactions throughout his route. The first one of note being with Death, as they both confirm Alucard has never fought Dracula at full power. When he faces his father, they have a pretty brief talk where they reminisce about the events of Castlevania. Castlevania 3. Alucard says at the time he was frightened to face his father, but now no more hesitation. I guess that character development from Nocturne of Reminiscence came through. After defeating his father, he later confronts the Time Reaper and saves the Time Rift. Now going back to his own era, we are left with this ending. Alucard continued to search for a way to destroy Dracula once and for all. When a prophecy foretold the arrival of a great Lord of Darkness in 1999, Alucard began preparations. Then prophecy became reality. 
Using a solar eclipse, Alucard succeeded in breaking Dracula's endless cycle of resurrection. But then came a new prophecy. In 2035, during a solar eclipse, a castle will arrive in Japan. So Alucard infiltrated a top secret Japanese government agency and resumed his vigil. This ending leads into Aria of Sorrow, which of course we've already discussed, but what we have here tells us a few more things. Alucard beginning preparations could be him gathering all the warriors that were there, even including the Lacard clan, who like the dynasties, were definitely most likely there. I don't think it was the Lacard sisters from Portrait of Ruin, since they are human by the end of the game, but one of their descendants, it's easily possible. Possible. We'll speculate on the roster a little later, but for now, this also confirms he was there, if his interactions with Julius and Donna Saro was too subtle for you. Lastly, and most interesting here, it appears Alucard wasn't in his organization during the battle. He seems to have joined it specifically for the events of Arya, but then where did the soldiers come from? The church? The military? It would make more sense if Alucard was in the organization during the events of 1999, and had taken the persona of Genya Arcado and all, but I guess that deconfirms it here. Either way, he prepared for Nosodamus' prophecy and succeeded in defeating his father in 1999. There are two other story modes in Judgment that could apply to 1999, and personally I think they do. Death and Carmilla's routes both don't lead into any specific game, like all the other characters here, but tells us they are resurrected with Dracula nearly every time. Death is pretty much a given to have been in the Demon Castle War, and I think this also applies to Carmilla as one of Dracula's strongest warriors. There are two key things that tell me that something crazy happened to these two in 1999. First, Carmilla does not appear in the Sorrow games, so she most likely met her permanent end in the events of 1999. As for Death, he becomes mute in the Sorrow games, not talking at all until Rickard Anza, where he's kinda depressed and really wants a Dark Lord, even going as far as to semi-casually ask Soma Cruz. Whatever happened to him in the battle I think gave him a reason to be silent and not talk for like almost 40 years. If we were to ever see the events of 1999, expect to see Carmilla's last stand and death getting traumatized. Oh, what a poor guy. Castlevania Judgment definitely has a lot of time travel with people like Aeon, the Time Reaper, but there's actually one more character, or should I say, Time Traveler, we can look at with information on 1999, Saint Germain. In the Castlevania continuity, him and his mission are perhaps one of the biggest mysteries that remain in the entire franchise, and don't you worry, I will be making a video dedicated solely to this mystery, but for relation to this video, Saint Germain needs to be discussed. Like Aeon, he is an all-seeing, kinda omnipresent god in Curse of Darkness, and he's so similar to Aeon because they're actually in the same group. Igarashi dubbed this group the Time Watchers when asked by a fan. We don't know much of anything else about them. However, let us have faith in the morrow. Aeon and Saint Germain know all about the Demon Castle War. I'll let him tell you himself. Faith in the morrow. Those are fine words. But not for me. As one who travels through time, I see the morrow a bit differently. All the same, the flow of time has stabilized at last. For myself, I think I will go far into the future and see what awaits. There is one great battle yet to be fought. The final battle between Lord Dracula and the humans. Perhaps they will remember your fight, or perhaps it will start anew. Now that we've discussed every single game with information on the Demon Castle War, we can properly discuss its potential roster. First, Julius Belmont was 1 billion trillion percent there. He was 19 and wielding the legendary vampire killer whip at its true power. He is the last and most powerful Belmont and fulfills his bloodline's destiny by defeating Dracula once and for all. Leon would be proud. Alucard is also confirmed to have played a gigantic part. Whether he was under the alias of Genya Arcado at this time or not, he fought alongside Julius and orchestrated many key aspects of their success, like the other warriors and the Hakuba clan. A Bolnada's clan member was likely there as we've discussed, as implied by Yoko in the Sorrow games. It was most likely Yoko's mother or father. They probably died, as Yoko does visit the Hagaba Shrine often, and one of the reasons for that could be her mourning them. Also, to complete the Castlevania 3 homage. Speaking of which... Speed kills. 
and I'm awfully fast. Like Bolnada's, a dynasty member was most likely there as can be derived by Michelle and Rikardanza. There's not much to go off of besides Michelle, but to complete the Castlevania 3 homage and nothing telling us otherwise, it's absolutely possible. That Lance... Are you of House Lacard? A Lacard member was most definitely there as well, although we don't know in what form. It's possible it could have been Stella and Loretta, although I don't think they would be fighting on the front lines or anything. I feel a new Lacard member is most likely, probably a descendant of Stella or Loretta, and wielding the legendary Alucard Spear. The events of 1999 would undeniably have shown us the fate, as they don't appear again in the series. Speaking of which, their counterparts. Warriors, revive! Now, while I would personally love an old Jonathan Morris to be in the fight, it's probably wishful thinking on my end. He would be in his 70s by 1999 and would have already passed down the vampire killer to Julius. However, it's possible he could have still been around, helping in the background maybe, or they could go full Tekken 7, Heiachi Mishima, and have a 7 year old man kick ass for the fate of the world. Or hell, another descendant maybe? It could be his and Charlotte's kid, I don't want to go full fanfiction on you guys, but I'm sure the Morris clan would have participated in some form. The priest of the Hakuba clan, Mina's unnamed caretaker, was the one to perform the ritual that sealed Dracula's castle inside the solar eclipse. As far as we know, he did this by himself, although it's possible other members of the clan could have helped him, seeing how powerful the magic needed to be to end Dracula's resurrection cycle. What does eternity hold for you? While we don't know what role they would have played, Saint Germain literally goes to 1999 at the end of Curse of Darkness, as you all saw. I think it's safe to say Aeon went with him as well, and most likely witnessed the events of 1999 unfold. I personally don't think they would have been that important, mainly just spectators to the one event in the timeline not yet come to pass. Now, with everything established, I present to you the complete legend of Castlevania 1999. This will include everything we've discussed, however, this will be my own interpretation of the events. For example, Jonathan passing down the whip to Julius. It definitely happened, but it's not confirmed, but it definitely happened. I'll be adding a few things like that to make the story flow, and a way for you to experience Castlevania 1999. Without further ado... In the 15th century, the prophet Nostradamus foretold of a great king of terror, the year 1999, seventh month. From the dark sky, Dracula Vlad Tepesh would rise at full power, wreaking havoc and chaos onto the world, the likes never before seen in recorded history. The seer's prediction would become known as the Great Prophecy, looming over the years even long after his death. The son of the prophesied Lord of Darkness, Adrian Fahrenheit Tepesh, Alucard, would discover the Great Prophecy once awoken from his eternal slumber. Siding with humans, Alucard would search for a way to once and for all destroy his father forever. However, throughout the ages, Dracula continued to rise time and time again, each more powerful than the last. Running out of options, time, and allies, the Dampier would finally find his answer in Japan, an ancient ritual with the power to seal gods. The Hakuba clan possessed the ability to confine anger, evil, and dark souls, symbols of demonic power binded within a solar eclipse for eternity. It was perfect. The priest of the Shrine of White Horses agreed to help Alucard. However, even with such a powerful ritual, it would not be enough to stop the great King of Terror. They needed the true power of the Holy Weapon, the Bane of Darkness itself, the Vampire Killer Whip, wielded by the long-lost Belmont bloodline to weaken Dracula's chaotic soul and magic. However, it would not be Alucard who would find the lost bloodline. Jonathan Morris, distant relative and current wielder of the Vampire Killer, found and trained the lost Belmont. Under Jonathan, Julius became one of the most powerful vampire hunters in history, awakening the hidden powers of the whip and learning of the destiny of his long heritage. As 1999 drew closer, Alucard, with the help from the church, gathered all of the descendants of the legendary warriors he had fought alongside throughout his life. Golnades, Adenasti, Alucard, Julius Belmont and Jonathan Morris, Ahakuba, and many, many others. Now with an army, Humanity was ready for Dracula's most powerful attack. Just as Nostradamus predicted, a full solar eclipse engulfed the world in darkness. As the sky turned black, 
Gods gathered to watch the final battle unfold. The fate of the world rested on these warriors, the past 500 years in preparation for this very moment. While the details of the legendary battle remain lost to time, we know the epicenter was fought in the creation of Chaos, Castlevania, in Europe. Humans and Dracula's legions of monsters fought with everything, many soldiers marching to their imminent death. Dracula's strongest generals arose with him, and all fought for their master to the very end, even costing some of them their very being. Fighting their way through armies, the vampire hunters managed to confront Dracula at his full power. But, even with Julius fighting with all he had, it was not enough against Dracula's oppressive might. The world on the brink of destruction, Julius Belmont sealed the vampire killer to Dracula's castle, the source of his demonic power, and weakened him enough to allow for Alucard's plan. As the priest of the Hakuba Shrine enacted the ancient ceremony, Julius Belmont finally managed to defeat Dracula at full power. Defeated, Castlevania was cut off from the Dark Lord, ending his resurrection cycle once and for all. The aftermath of the fight was bittersweet. Many died, but it was finally done. Julius, the one who defeated Dracula, was left without his whip and memories. Awakening far away some time later, all he could remember was his name started with the letter J. He then wandered for the next 36 years. Alucard suppressed his powers of the night after the battle, only vowing to use it for emergencies, and left the scene to mourn his father. All around the world, those who were born at the same moment of Dracula's defeat gained a dark power. One last gift from Matthias. The warriors that lived the fight went their own ways, some being lost to time forever. The great battle would be chronicled in history as the Demon Castle War of 1999, but in secret through the powerful organization that is the Church. However, it would be revealed to the world sometime later under mysterious circumstances. Dracula was finally defeated, bringing peace to the world. However, where there is light, there must always be shadow. A new prophecy came. In the year 2035, a new master will come to the castle, and he will inherit all of Dracula's powers. Some of you might be wondering why this all even matters. I mean, depending on how you look at it, this could all just be a glorified backstory made for a Game Boy Advance game in 2003. Castlevania's story doesn't even matter, right? I mean, this is ultimately the saga of buff Jojo dudes fighting that one popular vampire that's in the public domain. Most everyone that's not already a fan of these games sees the series as dead, and it's very unlikely we'll ever see a new title taking place in the original continuity by the passionate developers that made them in the first place. No new releases, Konami is an absolutely awful company that treats their intellectual properties like garbage, and people only care about Castlevania nowadays for Symphony of the Night and the Netflix show. Look it up anywhere and it's all Netflix and Symphony of the Night. Nobody cares about Akumato Dracula X, Tsuyo no Yakuza Yoku. Lenore fucking Hector is way cooler. But this is just not true. Even though the game series outside of Symphony of the Night Woo! I can't wait for the 87th review and retrospective, baby! Woo! It's a lot more niche nowadays. These stories and games still matter to people. These are experiences that have stood the test of time and are still with so many of us who have experienced them. The characters, consoles, art styles, music, yes, even the insane story. They mean something. And having this final chapter built up for so many years, only to be left to our imagination, doesn't feel intended. Not at all. This game was planned to be made, and hell, I wasn't crazy in my original video. Igarashi wanted it to be multiplayer, but we all know what happened. He never got to finish his story. We don't have the answer to built up plot lines, we don't know the intended fate of beloved characters, and although games like Grimoire of Souls give us a little bit more information, it's not made by the ones who started this narrative. And as such, I didn't count it for this video. I'll be taking a deep dive into that world next, but right now, it honestly just hurts. I started this YouTube channel one year ago because I wanted to express how I felt about this missing chapter. While I did not do the topic justice at all then, I found myself with a small community of passionate fans just like me. So many comments, stories, ideas, that classic fuck Konami, but damn, Castlevania is still so awesome. That's why I'm making this video now. 
to pretty much do what I couldn't one year ago, and finally give you all what my first video was meant to be. I've learned so much making these, and I still have a lot to learn, but I'm really happy I could show you all why this story means so much to me and so many others out there. The love for the Demon Castle War is still strong, even today. Seal of the Eclipse looks absolutely incredible and is a project you should all look out for. Fan animations that I'm probably going to use for b-roll in this video, but please check them all out. Links are in the description of course, and so many pieces of love throughout the community showing and expressing what they think the Demon Castle War of 1999 was like. I think somehow, in some form, we will see the events of 1999 in Castlevania. How or when, only time will tell. But Igarashi, his team, and that long ass narrative they crafted through these games will definitely stick with us for a long time to come. And the final battle with Dracula? Well, for now, it's always going to be up to our imagination. Admittedly, there is something cathartic leaving the ultimate battle, maybe, just maybe, eternally unseen. Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like, subscribe, and let me know your thoughts in the comments below. As a great man once said, take care of yourselves, and of course, as usual, please have yourself a damn good one. Take care, guys. Just like the sun. Just like